Welcome to Arena Craft, a podcast dedicated to Magic the Gathering Arena. My name is Arjuna. I am your host, and it's always great to have you back with us for another week. Now, this week we have an awesome interview with a brewer and video maker who I just connected with recently, and I'm excited to get to that. But first, just wanted to remind you that we have a little contest going on this month, and it's basically just trying to grow the presence of the show a little bit. And so what we're going to do is we're going to give away a $20 prize at the end of the month, can be $20 towards anything of your choice, whether it be a charity or a gift certificate to a website, could be buying you magic product, whatever you like. And all you have to do to enter this contest is just do one of the following can follow us on Twitter, you can like our page on Facebook, you can follow us, uh, subscribe on YouTube, you can join our Discord, or you can leave a review of the show on iTunes. So there you go, it's easy, it's convenient, that's all you have to do, and you can get entered into the running for a $20 gift card of your choice. So thank you very much to everyone who's been doing that, it's been wonderful seeing you. Another thing I wanted to mention was I've had this idea for a little while where I've wanted to do office hours, quote unquote. So basically, a few members of our community have already reached out to me asking for help with various things, whether it's refining a deck or going through a draft with them or whatnot. And I've really enjoyed doing this so far. And so here's how this is going to work. In the Discord channel, there is a voice channel and it's called Deck Help Chat. And what I'm going to do is just when I have some time, maybe if I'm just playing Magic by myself or whatever, I'm going to hop in that voice channel. And if you want help with something, you can just hop in there with me and, you know, just let me know what's on your mind and and maybe we can figure something out. And I'm just, you know, I'm just going to be doing this and seeing if anyone takes me up on it, but it's just a good way to you know, catch me and and maybe get a little bit more personal attention for whatever it is that you're interested in. So we're going to try this out, see if it's useful, see if I enjoy it, see if you guys enjoy it. And if so, then I might just make it a really regular thing. So in order to access that, just go ahead and join the Discord. The hours I expect to be available to do this are weeknights, probably after like 6 or 7 p.m. Pacific time. That's my time zone. And then you know, on the weekends when I have some time. So evenings and weekends, just uh, just look out for me. And if I'm in that channel, feel free to hop in and say hi. All right, now let's get on to our guest segment. I am pleased to introduce our latest guest to the show. This is somebody that I, like many people, have just discovered through a now famous Reddit post. And someone who really, I think, should have been getting a lot of press over the last year for her amazing YouTube videos. And this is a a content producer who's just got a very, very fresh take on magic and has been building some incredible brews, incredible creativity, and just posting content, which is a lot of fun and highly recommended. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Greta absurd heroine to the podcast how are you doing i am awesome thank you awesome it is great to have you here and i have so many questions for you but the first thing that i wanted to ask is how has it been for you these past couple of weeks oh my god these past couple weeks have been just a wild ride that little intro that you had for me just like warms the cockles of my heart like (laughs) you know starting off on youtube is really difficult and i knew that it was going to be a crazy climb Um, And for anybody who has started YouTube, like, hats off to you. It's a slog. You just have to keep on posting and slowly but surely you just get a little bit more and a little bit more. And that's how, you know, that's how it is. And then all of a sudden, like last week, and I was on vacation for this, or I guess it was two weeks ago now. It was just like, wham, one of my videos went up like a thousand views. And I was like, wait a minute, (laughs) what happened here? I had to do a little bit of research. But thankfully, people who came into the video, commented and said that they were there from Reddit. And I was like, oh, wow, crazy. So like somebody made a Reddit post, and as you said, um, and I just got a ton of traction from that post, which was insane. And it hasn't stopped since then. I have been growing exponentially in the past week and a half since that post went off. So thank you if the person who is 
who made that post is listening to this. Thank you so much. You've changed, you've changed my life. <laughs> it has been just a wild and wonderful ride. That's so cool. And it, it highlights like one of my favorite things about the internet and about the magic community and the gaming community in general, which is like, we all have these things that we love about the game. And we all have the people that we love following. And I just I love how you can be like, hey, this person's doing really cool stuff. I feel like more people need to know about this. And then to get that validation, like, yeah, people really do love this. And this does deserve to just get more attention. So I wanted to ask you for a brief overview of your magic history and how you got from there to where you are now. Oh, gosh, a brief overview. You're talking about like 20 years of my life. <laughs> <laughs> so I started right when the game came out, right? Because I was like 10 years old. The game came out in 93. I was right there on the scene. I had two older brothers um, and my father to give a little bit of, of background about how I was huge into this when it first came out. My father was, you know, a Silicon Valley nerd. So we had a computer in the house and like, I was up on video games. We had Nintendo and everything. I was like a little gamer, gamer girl. So when Magic the Gathering came out, we would go to the local magic store and both of my brothers would spend all of their allowance money on Magic the Gathering. And I would too, because I wanted to be just like them. And I loved games as it was in my own, you know, for my own right. And that's how it started. We just played and played a ton back in those days. I remember very specifically like looking at Urza's sunglasses and Urza's glasses and just being like, this is so cool. This guy is so cool. This Urza guy must be really cool. <laughs> <laughs> and I, d I didn't know anything about the story and didn't care about the story. I just loved playing. I just loved playing the game. Um, and it was something that I could do to interact with my brothers that wasn't like direct interaction or like athletics because <laughs> they immediately would beat me in those things. Um, so I was able to... Brothers, man. Yeah, brothers. Older brothers. I mean, I don't know if younger brothers are just as bad, but anyway. As one, I can confirm they also suck. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> Fair. Siblings, just family. <laughs> um, yeah, so I played for a very long time when I was very young. And as a lot of people who have played Magic the Gathering, you know, over these years that it has been out, I took breaks here and there. Um, I was really big in high school doing it once I started getting my own job. I would actually spend my own money on my own games, and that ended up being magic. And um, then when I went to college, I actually had a college crew that would go to Friday Night Magics and like all that stuff. And we were really big into magic then as well. And then I took a bit of a hiatus after college, just getting, you know, career under your feet and just kind of forgot about some of that stuff. And then um, my, I have a really close friend, and maybe some people might actually know this guy, Marlon Egolf is one of my closest friends, and he won a Magic World Championship, I think. No way. It, it might not have been a World Championship, but he was like a big championship winner, and he had his own um, YouTube personality. He uh, actually used to work with uh, DraftMagic.com. I don't know if you know them, but Draft Magic is like a YouTube channel uh, sponsored. Not really. Um, and he used to draft for them. So he like started doing YouTube videos for that. And I was like, oh, man, I'm so I want to do this. This looks like so much fun. He's, um, you know, people started getting to know him and stuff like that. And I was like, I really want to do this. Uh, so many years went by. I never got the chance to do it. Like just, you know, it's one of those things you put on the back burner and you're like, ah, someday maybe. And then eventually I was just like. I'm just going to do this. You know, there's no time like a present. I had a child like a couple of years ago and I was like, you know what? If I don't do something, it's just not going to happen. So let's just do it and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And that was a year ago now. And did the advent of Arena, did that uh, kind of spur the development? Yes. Okay. hundred percent. So as anybody who is listening to this might know who is a parent, or even if not, um, children are very expensive, right? So I can't <laughs> yeah. really afford Magic the Gathering online. And that was like a big problem. Not only did I not have a lot of money, but I also didn't have a lot of time. And what Magic the Gathering Arena offered me was the chance to play limited without having to take out like two or three hours of my life of just sitting there 
um, drafting with other people and playing the games and then waiting for everyone else to finish and then having to play another game and waiting for everybody else to finish. Yeah, so like that was just a huge chunk of time that I just didn't have. So Magic the Gathering Arena just lets you sit there as long as you like and take your time picking, you know, your cards. And, you know, if a baby cries, you can go run and take care of the baby and like all that stuff. And then it's still there like later for you to pick up later on when they're sleeping. And and then like, when you're playing against other players, you can take breaks in between games. It was just so much more accessible for a busy adult. And, you know, yeah, sure, I have a baby and like, or, you know, she's a taller now, but at the time where I got really big into it, um, she was a little bit more time dependent and she was dependent on my time. But I'm sure anybody else who also has difficulty with, um, you know, the difficult schedules or whatnot could also look at arena and be like, wow, this is just makes life so much easier (laughs) for me. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, that was really, really big. Cool. So you started recording these videos and putting them up on YouTube. And did you like, did you have a direction for your channel at that point? Or was it just kind of like, I'm going to record when I feel like it. And then it just evolved from there. It was definitely, uh, I will record when I feel like it. I knew that I wanted to make it as serious as possible. So if you go and watch like some of my earliest videos, I tried really hard to do three a, three a week. That was my first goal. And that ended up being like way, way too much. So eventually it did just evolve into one video a week. But you could see the product, the quality of my videos grow exponentially every single time that I released a video because I switched my whole entire office around to help with lighting and I got better microphones. I bought like two or three different sets of microphones as like over the course of the year as I was getting more and more into it. Um, So while I didn't have like an exact idea of what I wanted to do, I was feeling it out as I went around and I knew that I wanted to be serious. I want to provide high quality to my viewers And I think that really did matter so that when I was kind of discovered last week or whatnot, people could see that I am producing really good quality videos. I do care. I care a lot about what I am producing. Yeah. So I've noticed that it seems like on your channel, you do a mix of kind of fun, wacky brews and more serious brews. Is there like one side of that spectrum that you tend to lean more towards? Oh, yeah. Um... I just love, I love jank. Um, (laughs) I love, perhaps that's not quite correct. I mean, I do love jank, but I love different angles of, of stuff. Like if you were to look at even my like meta decks, I don't do anything purely meta. Like here's Temer Clover, like here's Mono Red. I've never played Mono Red. And I will probably never play Mono Red. <laughs> Excellent. A mage after my <laughs> own heart. Yeah. But that's because you see it all the time. So for me, playing Magic isn't about winning. Yes, winning is nice. Winning is good. And there is some fun in winning. But it's boring. You know what I mean? And what I find exciting, where I get my passion from, is from discovering my own brews, discovering my own things that work, my own combos, and then seeing that work when I bring it to life, when I bring it to the table. Yeah, and just like that satisfaction of having an idea and actually watch it unfold and play out, right? Right. So yeah, I think that you have developed somewhat of a reputation of being a brewer and definitely of being like a creative brewer. And so that's something that I wanted to focus on here was just getting a bit more into the brewer's mindset, because I think that a lot of magic players would like to do more of this. I think a lot of magic players have that feeling of, I would like to have this ownership. I would like to bring this creative element to the game, but then they'll throw something together and they'll just get crushed and it won't, it just won't feel quite right. And then they'll get demoralized. So one of the things that I wanted to ask you about was just like to go a little bit more into your methodology around brewing. So one of my first questions there was, where do you get your inspiration from? Like, where do your brews start? So my brews start in a number of different spots. But I do want to say before I tell you where my brews start, brewing is not something that you just come up with and you throw it on the field and you're like, this is going to be awesome. I play test a lot and 
a lot of the brews that I do put together, you don't see videos of because they fail. Brewing is, especially like jank brewing, is it's got to be something that you love to do because you are going to fail like quite a bit. So I would suggest if you do love brewing or you find some enjoyment out of it, just don't give up like when you fail or if you have a failed experiment just put it away. It's fine. There are many times I could even give many examples of within re- arena timeline of me creating brews and just not being able to make the card work like throughout the entire time that it was in arena. Like a good example is Tashana. Tashana of the Thundering Voice is a card that's power and toughness equals the amount of cards that you have in your hand. Like it's such a cool concept but she was just so expensive. She was like seven mana or something like that. And I could never make her work consistently. I could make her work every now and then and be like, this is awesome. This is a video. Let's do it. And then when I sit down to record the video, I'm like there for five hours failing. And that's just the worst feeling in the world, especially if time is limited and precious to you. So, you know, just because uh, some of my brews are cool and look great, that's, a uh, subset of all of my brews. <laughs> like, I, it, they do fail sometimes. Right. So we're, we're kind of seeing the tip of the iceberg there, huh? Yeah, right. Well, I mean, I don't want to discourage brewing. Brewing is awesome and super fun. And, and janky brews are like super great. And you do succeed more often than you do fail, especially once you get good at it. Like it is a, it is a skill. But the truth is that sometimes something that you think is really cool that sparks your creative fire might just fail and that's you know you got to just step back and be like okay (laughs) let's try the next one come back later it's very like artistic you are an artist when you were doing this and just like when you're painting a painting or whatever you're like "Ah, i just can't get the fucking trees or whatever (laughs) i'm sorry can i swear (laughs) Uh, yeah swearing is encouraged (laughs) okay i should have clarified that (laughs) yeah 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 go for it then like you know you're gonna you can't, sometimes you just have to back away and, and then you can come back to that brew later and maybe you'll figure it out. Maybe it'll click, but it is, it is definitely more of an art form than, than a mathematical form, or maybe a, it's a mixture of the two. Yeah. And I like how you highlight that there's just a learning in it. So like not giving up when you might not be particularly good at it at first. And I think that the, the art metaphor is a really good one, right? Because it's like, if you're first learning how to do figure drawing or watercolor painting or whatever, like your first number of sketches are just probably not going to be that good. And yeah. it's just like, you have to kind of take that in stride. And I think maybe you can get discouraged in magic because there's like a binary outcome in a magic game, right? Either you won it or you lost it. I mean, occasionally you you draw, but most of the time it's a win or a lose. And so like if you mm. if you look at a painting and you think, well, it wasn't that good, but you know, I was kind of proud of this one thing over here, right? It's a little bit different than in a magic game where it's just like, I just lost 20 games in a row. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's something that could be said to that for sure. And this would be off topic, but I really feel that as a magic player, just a competitive player of any sort, you do need to um, temper yourself about losses. Like, you will always lose. People who are at the very top of magic will, you know, they lose all the time. So even if you lose, you do have, there's plenty of good things that you can take away from it, like a lesson that you might have learned or something cool that you got to see from your opponent's deck, something creative um, that you had never thought of before. So this is part of the reason why I don't like the meta meta, you know, is because the meta, like if you're copying, pasting somebody's mono red deck, then that's all that it is. You're just getting that like one or zero, I won or lost. Um, Whereas if you're playing um, for the experience of the game and you love it and you are creating a fun brew and you're sitting down with a friend or an opponent online, then it's about the experience more than it is about that just I have won or lost. And I think it's not just magic in that case. This is competitive gaming across all genres. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I appreciate that perspective for sure. I mean, I I think there is a certain amount of artistry to like playing someone else's deck, right? But I agree. I I think there's just like a lot to gain from building your own decks. And I think that can really grow you as a magic player in different ways. And, And like you said, just bring you a lot of satisfaction. So could you take us through the typical process that you go through when you're when you're making a brew? Sure. Um, so I get my 
inspiration from like when I'm looking when I'm looking for a new deck to build like okay I've got to make a new video or I'm curious I want to see what else is out there I always start with um, like an online deck builder or just looking at the cards right I just go through all of the cards and look at them and see if any particular card like strikes my fancy and a good example of this would be a Trata or a Tempsis the all-seeing just one card that's got something cool going on with it where you're like let me see if I can make something happen here and then you just or I just you know look through the catalog of cards and see if anything like hits me and in the case of Atrada, you're looking through you're looking through you come across like enigmatic incarnation you're like huh wait a minute this I think could work this could do something so let me ask you about that because I watched that video of yours and I thought that that was a really good example of really building around a card and having like a creative process so when you were looking at Atrata, were you already thinking I want a way to be able to fetch this out of my deck or, or was the enigmatic incarnation just like a happy coincidence? No, Atrata is one of those cards like Deshana, where I've looked at her a number of times and tried to make her work and couldn't make her work and just kind of threw her away. Like, okay, you can't just let Atrata sit in your deck as a four of and expect to get her and make a deck around that. And then putting her in any other deck just doesn't make sense, right? So Atrata is just one of those weird cards that just doesn't make sense to use unless you're like building the entire back deck around her. So I was specifically looking for something like Enigmatic Incarnation to bring her out. Nice. And so just break down for us quickly how this combo plays out for people. We'll put a link to this in the show notes as well, because I think this is a really good example of one of your decks and, and a good way for people to get into your content. Break down to us a little bit about like what this interaction is and how you built around it. Sure. Uh, so Enigmatic Incarnation is a enchantment that comes out on your side of the board. And how it reads is at the end of your turn, you can sacrifice an enchantment and then search for a creature card with a converted mana cost equaling one plus the sacrificed enchantment. Enigmatic Incarnation stays on the field. So as long as you have a enchantment that is three converted mana cost, you can fetch an Atrada out of your deck. And if you don't know what Atrada does, she is a three five for four mana. And when she attacks, she's unblockable, right? She cannot be blocked. And when she deals combat damage to a player, you can have her target a creature an opponent controls and exile that creature with a hit counter on it. And then she gets shuffled back into your deck, which is like the big part, right? The, that's like the big hard part is she gets shuffled back into your deck. So you have to go find her again and then you can bring her back out again. And once you have uh, three cards with hit counters on them, you just win the game. You just win it. It's yours. No matter how much life they have, no matter how much you don't have, doesn't matter. Oh, so like I these alternative that win conditions. Yeah, so it's these alternative win conditions that are cool to me. This is like a puzzle just waiting to be solved. It just like itches my brain. I love it. I love it. So I had tried a number of times to get her to work, but Enigmatic Incarnation is really her partner in crime. And that, like, there are some three drop enchantments that just work beautifully with her. Like Treacherous Blessing uh, is a three converted mana cost enchantment that when you put it on the field, you draw three cards. But it's got the condition that while it's on the field, anything you cast deals one damage to you. So it's kind of like not a beneficial thing to have on the field. You want to get rid of it. And so this works perfectly. This interaction works perfectly. You get Treacherous Blessing out, helps you draw into your Enigmatic Incarnation. You put an inc Enigmatic Incarnation on the field, and then you sacrifice the Blessing for an Atrata. It's just, it's such a feel-good combo. It really is. Well, and one of the things that I like about this deck is so before Enigmatic Incarnation, it's like even if you did have a way to fetch a Trata every turn, like you'd have to cast it, you'd be taking a turn off, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the cool thing about this deck is that if you get it lined up right, you can just be like attacking with a Trata every single turn. And I think that that's what makes it so devastating. Yeah. If you get your engine online and your opponent has any creatures out on the field, then forget it. I mean, even if they don't have creatures on the field, if they're just a creature-based deck and that's how they win, like, forget it. There, there's nothing that you can do against an enigmatic incarnation deck with a Trata in it if you get your engine going. It does have glaring weaknesses, obviously. Like, if it's if you're playing against a control deck, then you're in for, you know, a lot of pain. Yeah, hurt. yeah. But 
I'm sure you could sideboard into something. So, okay, so cool. So you had this great interaction, which was enigmatic incarnation with Atrata. And then, of course, that led you to look at the best three mana enchantments to put in your deck to turn on Atrata. So I think like that, you know, that part of the deck, not necessarily that it builds itself, but it, it kind of makes some of your choices very clear. And I was curious about, okay, so you've got this car of a deck, right? You have eight cards, Atrata, Enigmatic Incarnation, and then you have, what, like eight to 12 other enchantments maybe to turn on your Enigmatic Incarnation. And like, how do you choose what what to do next, right? Like once you've got the car of the deck and you still need card slots to flesh it out, how do you go about that? Um, so it depends on the deck, but the things that you can look at that make it a little bit easier are um, you need removal. Most decks need removal, um, especially if you're like a combo deck that the combo isn't like an aggro kind of combo like this one. So that's why you put things like Murderous Rider in there, which is like just top tier removal, especially for Planeswalkers. With removal, you have to, those are a couple of things that you have to worry about. Like you definitely have to worry about Planeswalkers because this is a Planeswalker heavy meta right now. Just they're everywhere. <laughs> I mean, War of the Spark came out, right? So that's the thing. Sweepers are really, really good. Like, um, so that's why you put in, you know, Ritual of Soot. You could also put in Cry of the Carnarium or something like that if that was more your speed. So you want to make sure that you have ways of dealing with with issues, answers for questions, basically. And Thought Erasure is another one, like Hand Hate, that kind of stuff. Those are also like answers. And then the rest of it, if it's a combo deck, you want to have ways of searching for your combos and if it's not a combo deck, if it's just like creature based deck, then you want to have ways of supporting supporting that. Like if you have your core, then you have to have support around your core. And that's either to like search for your core or to, you know, other creatures that kind of help out with your core. And also, so after you um, have the idea of what you kind of want and the holes that are missing on like the interaction level, you also need to think about the holes that are missing on the mana curve level. And this is like really important. And this, when you, when you match these two up, like, okay, what am I missing from an interaction perspective? And then what am I missing from a converted mana curve? Then you have narrowed down the stuff that you ideally want to have in your deck. And then you can just make your own personal choices based on what you feel is best. Or at this point, this is when playtesting comes in and you can find out what actually really works in practice uh, rather than just what you think might work. So I, I just want to highlight that point because I think it's really important about the mana curve. And I think it's especially important when you consider what an ideal mana curve would look like for your style of deck. So... For example, one thing that I hear deck brewers complain about a lot is they'll say something like, you know, I really want to make a good red-black aggro deck in standard, but there just aren't any good aggressive black two drops or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm not mm -hmm. like I'm not talking about a specific standard, but just to throw that out as an example. Yeah, cuz there are plenty right now. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. But like Red deck red black does not have any problem with two drops. There's t way too many two drops. <laughs> there are a lot of two to and the a lot point of three where they're not too. a lot of them don't even matter but that's the kind of of issue that a brewer might run into right is you might look at the format and be like i would really love to have more cards that do this thing at this cost in this deck and when i pull up the list of them there aren't you know it's like there aren't enough of them or i don't like the ones that are there or they don't synergize with my deck right so i think that that's just an important thing to think about and i think you highlighted it really well where it's like this particular deck is an enchantment synergy deck and it happens to be like a really enchantment heavy set so great like you're all set like you have excellent three drop enchantments that you can cast to fetch your atrata right but in a format that didn't have those you know you might not be able to brew this deck yeah that's definitely a good point there's two things that i would say to that one is i mean just the way that the set was built i mean enigmatic incarnation is a card that was created in the mind that you know with the mindset that there were going to be a lot of enchantments in this set. right right um so Thankfully, Wizards does have like an understanding of the synergies. I'm not going to say that they're awesome at <laughs> their card design, but they're also not that, you know, they're not bad at their card design either. <laughs> they um, learned so, a thing or two. 
they have learned a thing or two. Uh, we're still getting bans, but you know, whatever. Oko was a card that was made, like, we shouldn't talk. We're not talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've, we've moved on, right? <laughs> yeah, we've moved on. Thank God. So another thing to think about is if you're finding holes in your converted mana cost curve, then you could look for X cards, you know, that have X in their converted mana cost or a card that has some sort of activated ability that could use up your mana during those turns that you are that you don't have anything to do or that's a little bit low on cards or do ramp instead if you're if you've got like a lull in your four slot or your three slot then you could do some ramping cards on your two or or your three drop to kind of like jump over those bits um, so you do have to sometimes, if things, if the stars don't align, you do kind of have to mold the clay a little bit and look at, look at your different options. Yeah, that's a really good point. Like a card that fills in a lot of gaps in the format right now is growth spiral, right? So that's like an yeah. example of a productive thing that a deck can do on two mana when it really might not have that many other good things to be doing on that turn. Right, Exactly. That's such a good point. And I think it's an easy thing to forget. And I think it's one of the things like when you look through a a deck list, and especially like uh, if someone comes up with a new brew, and you don't you're looking through it, and you don't really understand it. I think that 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 can be a thing to remember is like, hmm, is this card here because it is filling a mana slot? Or is it here because it's helping to enable some other thing that the decks actually built around? So I think it's it's always good to remember that kind of stuff because, you know, oftentimes the brews that you're likely to see a lot of, you know, are made by experienced brewers like yourself or Crokies or, you know, these people who are kind of like on the ladder a lot croquis. and used to brewing a lot, right? And sometimes you look at their decks and you just think like, why, why is that card in there? Why did that person include that? And yeah. um, oftentimes it will have one of those considerations that's maybe a little bit invisible until you start playing the format and you start actually seeing how how your cards play out. Yeah, and Crokey's, um Crokey's is like one of my favorite players right now of all time. Um, and one of the great things about him is that you can, he often builds on stream. And one of the great takeaways from his builds is that he just sits there in silence for like minutes at a time sometimes just thinking. And that is kind of a really good example that you don't see often. Like you, that's not how you think it, it works. Like you think, oh, some mad scientist is like there and like just putting all these cards in and just knows what to do. And that's not really the case. When it comes to brewing, there's a lot of just sitting and thinking and looking around and and trying bits out and putting things in and being like, wait, that doesn't make any sense. Um, let's try it a different way. And he like has it online so that you can you can see it happening. And there and he's not just you know making crazy jank brews. This guy's making like top you know ten mythic decks that other people haven't thought of yet. I think his recent Bant deck, I've I've talked about it before on this podcast, but I think it's a really excellent example of a brew which it seems a little inscrutable at first. Like you look at his list, he's running one Arboreal Grazer main deck. He's running like one Cavalier of Thorns. He's got two Mystical Disputes. And it, you just you read down the list and you're like, surely this can't be right. You know, like, how, <laughs> like what, what creative process creates a deck that has this combination of cards main deck? But I think that that's just a, a further example of how, like you said, it's kind of like answers to problems. I have this core of this deck that I know is strong and and I have to devote a certain number of slots to answering problems. And then once you start thinking about that a bit more, the layers peel back and you can kind of read into what he's doing there a little bit more. It's very cool to watch. Awesome. Before we move on from this, I just wanted to ask if you have any other general advice for the aspiring brewers out there to be thinking about. Yeah, I would say, first off, uh, just get to know the cards. Um, And I know that seems really obvious, but... If you are interested in brewing, just go through the cards often. I don't remember all of the cards myself. I don't remember all the text on all the cards myself. But when I'm looking, you know, when I have that feeling like, ah, I want to 
I want to brew something new. I want to do something new. Um, just go through all of them again and see if anything just like grabs your interest because that's usually where a brew starts. And once that card or combination of cards grabs your interest, just go for it. Just like create a ton and maybe even make numerous different combinations of decks and just play test all of them and see what, you know, and you put it through the filter. You put, it's like, it's like draining, you know, through a cheesecloth or something like that. You just, you just find the best chunks to, to grab onto and put that into the next iteration of the deck and just constantly be refining. And that's kind of, uh, the basic process, uh, of brewing. Just find something delicious and keep filtering it. So what I'm picking up from this is that you might have a brew that's 80% complete or whatever, or, you know, you did complete it and you feel like it's just a handful of cards away from being good. And then it sounds like you might just sit on that for a while until, in this case, for example, you know, you sit on a charter for a while until all of a sudden, finally, they print the right card that lets you do that, right? So do you do a fair amount of that where you just have like a collection of cards or like a deck that just didn't quite get there that you come back to every once in a while to see if you can update it? Yes, I do. I have like a whole slew of decks that I have in what I call the work in progress. I use Aetherhub for like all of my deck building right now. I, I had used a number of different ones from around the internet. I was even planning about programming my own because they're all kind of bad in their own way. But Aether Hub has the best, in my experience, way to sort your decks and keep them in order. So I have like a whole, I have like 10 decks or so that are just kind of in the work in progress section. And when I have a bit of time, I'll look through them and see what strokes my interest at the moment. And that can be, you know, anything like, oh, I'm feeling Mardu. I haven't seen Mardu in a while. What's the Mardu deck that I have in work in progress? Let's open it up and take a look and see how it looks. And does it look good? Uh, yeah, no, but let's, you know, this here and tweaks here and there. And then maybe when I get home at night, that might not be the one that I want to play test. I might not be feeling Mardu anymore because I had actually worked on it, you know, for a half hour during my lunch break or whatever. So I'll pull out, you know, another deck and then I'll play test that other deck. So I have like, I have a bunch of different decks running at any moment of time that I am brewing. And then when I feel like a deck has reached its pinnacle in a spot where it feels really good, where I feel like it can be entertaining to have people watch, whether or not it will win a lot, because some of these brews aren't meant to win a lot. They're just meant to win in really cool ways, like the Attempsis deck. So I made an Attempsis all-seeing deck, which is not a deck that wins very often, but it wins in a really weird way. And when it does, it feels really cool. <laughs> nice. That card's hard to build around. Yeah, that card was actually really fun to build around. That was a blast. And I think that was actually one of my first more successful videos. Oh, great. So we can we can see that one in action then. Yeah, yeah. That was the first one to actually get over a thousand views was my attempts to all seeing deck. Nice. And this just reminds me of a, a core concept that I find myself keep coming back to on the show, which is just that I think another thing that really helps brewing is keeping track of card clusters. And what I mean by card clusters is like just groups of cards that you know work well together and that you might be able to transport into different spots. So an example of this in the previous standard was what people called the Explore package, right? So that was Wild Growth Walker. Right. Oh, God, the Explore Crunch. God. Yeah, Murpho Crunch Walker, <laughs> right? It was like you would... Yep. You would just like see this group of 12 to 16 cards popping up in just like so many decks that ran those Golgari colors. And a, an example from the more recent standard is the Elementals package where you have your Risen mm. Reef and your, your Cavalier. I just think that it's really good to when you discover a package that you like, whether it's you came up with one yourself, or you know, an opponent played one against you, it's just good to file that away. Because oftentimes you can use that as a basis for doing other cool things, you know, like, like you can just take that along to a lot of different decks. Like, for example, that Elementals package. More recently, we saw a version, and I actually think Crokies was playing this as well, which was like Elementals into the Thassa agent combo. Yeah. 
Uh, cancer. Yeah, there's so many different decks that you can put that combo into, right? But that was just, that was one of them that felt good and that had a certain flow to it. So I think that's a really important part of deck building as well. One of the clusters that I have worked the hardest is the Kiara Lotus Field combo. Mm. And I have a soft spot for this whole thing. And I can't tell you how many different brews I've made that have been Kiara Lotus Field Tails End decks because I just really love the... I, I just love trying to break Lotus Field, basically. Yeah. One way that you can actually break Lotus Field is using Brought Back. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> if that's yep. another thing you're interested in. But yeah, I will tell you, dude, one of my favorite decks of all time in recent history... Well, actually, that's... their are contradicting thoughts. One of my most favorite, <laughs> favorite decks in recent history is... um. Lotus Field Blood Sun. That was a sweet combo. Which was when you could bring it on, yeah, and not have to sacrifice. And that had Kiora in it, obviously, and like all the Cavaliers. And that was one of my favorite decks to play. It was such a blast. And honestly, I'm thinking about going back to Historic just to play it. Nice. Nice. Um, Because I actually, I haven't played Historic at all. It's just, I've been doing nothing but Standard because that's where my focus is and my love is. But I might go back to just have the nostalgia of playing that deck. Oh, and I, I mean, I imagine too. Historic just affords so many more and broader brewing possibilities as well. Yeah, I mean, since my return to Magic when Arena was released, um, I have been just doing nothing but standard mostly. I mean, when I first got in, um, I was doing a lot of limited, but now I'm kind of just in love with standard right now. But as my cards and these decks that I'm brewing and Uh, you know, my loves just rotate out, I might end up going into historic here and there just for the nostalgia. Like, hey, honey, we used to have a good time together. (laughs) (laughs) You remember that night? (laughs) I do. We'll always have Paris. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so that's so cool. And I feel like I could talk with you about brewing all night, but I did... Also, just want to focus on your channel a little bit because I wanted to give people a chance to get to know your content a little better. And also, I just think that it's really cool to talk with a person who's like really active in the process of developing and growing their content. Because I think a lot of times we get exposed to people who are like already that they've already gone through this process of really growing an audience and really maturing their offering and really refining what they do. And so I'd love to just ask you some questions about what are you thinking about right now as far as how to expand and your channel right or like now that you've got a little wind in your sails what are you excited about doing to grow that momentum oh man so you want me to talk about what i have done or you want me to talk about what i am currently doing let's do both so let's start with how did you and you know we'll, we'll have to keep it short here because i'm sure that there's a lot of detail <laughs> but what do you feel like it was that you did to go from nobody knowing about you on YouTube to having a following? Oh, man. Well, so that was luck-based, right, to a degree because of the Reddit post, right? But but like pre the Reddit post, you had a following and you were growing something. And yeah. so like what what did you do to, to get to that point? Posted, really, just like put videos up. That's the biggest hurdle that you can get over is just doing it like and I know that's just do it like but (laughs) I mean you it's difficult to sit down and make a video like record a video and then edit it watch your face listen to your voice while you're editing and I'm sure you understand this perfectly well as a content creator but it's so weird to like when you get started and you're just like oh god I look awful I sound awful this is dumb no one's gonna like it but what I had to eventually tell myself is that, you know, it's it's never going to be perfect. You're never going to do so well to the point where you are super happy with yourself. You just have to push it and get it out there. And there were so many times where I was just like, this is, what am I doing? But I posted it anyway because I just, you know, need to put it out there. And other people liked it. They didn't crap all over my videos. The, the, my early adopters, and I don't know if this is just early adopters in general, whether this is just kind of how they are as as, uh, as people, 
They're just so nice, so supportive. My early adopters, I love you guys. You're all out there. You know who you are. If you're listening to this, thank you for everything because you gave me the confidence in myself and what I was doing and that I wasn't crazy and that I could do this um, was possible. And then all after that, it was just, you just have to keep going. It doesn't matter how slow you go, just so long as you don't stop, right? That <laughs> Twitter quote, <laughs> not Twitter, sorry, Tumblr quote, gosh. You just have to keep going. And that's what I did. And I am a huge um, YouTube fan. Like I watch a ton of YouTube and I love watching Let's Plays. I love I love the types of videos that I am myself creating. I've watched them for many, many, many years. And I know what I like and I know what is good. And I was like, you know, I have to fix my lighting. I have to change where I'm sitting. I have to change where my camera is. You know, all these things every single week, even this week. Like my video that went out this week, it was as per hero. And I noticed my lighting is off and it's bothering the heck of me. Every single time I look at that video, I'm like, oh God, my lighting is so awful. So like, I need to make sure that I know you know, I have to have a checklist for when I start recording, like, are my lights correct? Like, da, 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 da. So I'm always trying to improve. And that's what happened, you know, in my channel before I was quote unquote discovered or um, had this big influx of, of viewership and subscribers. I was always trying and currently to this day, you know, it's never, it's never stopping. I'm always trying to make things better for my viewers, make my video quality better, make my auto quality better. I went through like two or three different video cameras. I went through a couple of different microphones and microphone like pop filters. I did a ton of research and I loved every second of it because I really just wanted to provide the best quality video for my viewers while I am doing what I love, playing video games. Like I love video games. I love YouTube. I love all the stuff. I love everything about it. So I just kind of got obsessed with it. Um, and it just kind of took over my life a bit. That's awesome. And I love that the part that really resonated for me about what you said was just that you identified the things that you liked and the things that worked for you and the things that were important to you. And then you really took those forward into your content. You know, I, I can say the same for me, you know, from my years of producing podcast content and whatever. It's like when I'm listening to a podcast, I'll be like, oh, I never like I never <laughs> want my podcast to sound like that. Right. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. You get like almost snobbish about it. Like I don't listen to some podcasts now because like, oh, man, their microphone sounds like they're recording in a bathroom. Like I can't yeah. listen to this, even if it might be like nice guys or girls, like nice people and good content but I just can't. Yeah. And so, but I, I just love that you like really took that to heart and took that into your own work. And I think that that is, that's something that anyone who produces content can come back to and remind themselves of is like, what do I think is good? What works for me? How, you know, like if, if this wasn't my content, if I was taking in my own content as someone else's content, like what would annoy me about it? Yeah. You want to make something that you're proud of. Totally. Which you have, and, and clearly it's really awesome content and other people love it. So moving forward, like, what are you developing? What are you moving towards? Oh, my God. So I have I have a crazy, <laughs> since this week has um, has been so, like, crazy, so wild to, to use the same term over and over again, because uh, my lexicon is very cheap. But, like, since this, since this past couple of weeks, um, it hasn't just been subscribers and viewers. Yes, that has been crazy. But I've also been contacted by Magic the Gathering themselves to become part of the creator program. So well, congratulations, by the way, that's amazing. Thank you. It's very, very cool. So all this kind of stuff just like dumped on me all at once. I'm like, oh, my God. So I have a couple of things that I, I'm planning on doing. I mean, if I do want to start streaming regularly. I don't know when I'll have the time to do that. But I am going to be streaming for special occasions. And there's going to be uh, my year long anniversary um, for my, fir my first anniversary in April. So I'm going to be doing a special stream on in April on April 6th. And the creator program, the Magic the Gathering creator program is going to support me on that day and like share me on social media. If you see if you follow their Twitter or anything like that, you'll see they do this. They're like, look at Derpiter. They have a special stream today. Like go there. So they're going to do that for me on that day, which is awesome. I'm also updating my Patreon. I have a couple of patrons, which is awesome. Thank you so much, patrons. 
And um, I'll be updating a lot of that stuff. I will eventually be creating merch. I'm a big fan of drinking. I'm pretty sure everybody knows that because that's my <laughs> avatar is like my, mon- you know, my in-game moniker is loves whiskey. Um, and I really do. And I drink a lot when I'm on stream or I'm sorry, when I'm recording. So a lot of people do know that I, I like to drink. So I was thinking about like creating tumblers for my merch or something like that, just like have my logo on it or something simple. It could be like, you know, little lapel pins or t-shirts, you know, the usual, the usual fare. So I'll probably be doing that at some point. I do want to make more content. So right now I'm only releasing one video a week. I would like to up that. I don't have a ton of time, but like as I become more and more popular and get more and more patrons, I will eventually be able to phase out my current job and then make this my full-time job which is the goal that is the true goal to just ha- just do this and at that point I will obviously be releasing way more content but in order to get there I understand that I do need to start releasing at least a little bit more I think um, so I have a couple of like mini series ideas that I might do where I record with friends of mine for like all day or for like a week or something like that and then release it in weekly chunks. So it seems like I am making more content every week, but I'm actually just backlogging a bunch of stuff and releasing more stuff each week just so that I have more more stuff to show on YouTube. And then way in the future, way in the future, I would love to um, have other channels where I'm not just doing Magic the Gathering because I do love Magic the Gathering, but I just love video games in general. In some of the old stuff that I used to play when I was a kid, like uh, all the Quest for Glory, you know, Sierra games, all the Sierra point and click adventure games, like all that stuff. I would love to do let's plays of other video games and post those on like sister channels and stuff like that. That's that's like far into the into the future. But I, I have a lot of stuff planned for this channel and then beyond. So I am a planner. (laughs) I will never run out of things to do. I will obviously have to like change up my entire office so that I I take over everything and do all the lighting and better green screens and better everything. So I will always be improving. I'm never going to be just standing still and you can count on that for sure. That's awesome. Well, I'm really excited to hear it and I can see all of this happening. It's really clear to me that you're going places and people are picking up on it and it's really exciting. So, you know, for any of you listening who aren't yet familiar with Greta's content, go check it out. Be one of the people who got in on the ground floor and, you know, is part of something really exciting that you'll look back on years from now and be like, yeah, I was there. I was there doing doing that thing, participating in that community. Awesome. Well, before we go here, I just wanted to quickly ask a question for our newer players in Arena. I'm just trying to cover all of our bases here. And I know that you had played Magic a lot before you came to Arena, but what's something that you really like wish you had known coming into Arena or something that you think would really the most benefit new players playing specifically on Arena? Gosh. Um, yeah, I think... The best thing for new arena players is to is two things, right? I would play limited, right? And so if you don't know what limited is, that's sealed or draft. And that's because, one, you don't have to have cards in order to do well. Because they're all cards that are just coming out of straight out of packs. And all the other players who are playing also are playing with that same kind of uh, concept where it's all just coming out of, out of packs. They're not building their own decks so they're not you know they don't have the wild you know you're playing against people who have like wild cards who have you know all the mythics and all the rares when you're going into like play or competitive or something like that in limited you don't have to deal with that so if you don't have a lot of cards in your collection i would highly suggest playing limited and i would also suggest watching videos of people play limited just to get your head around what is a good pick and what isn't and what you can kind of like build your stuff around. I'm not saying you have to do a ton of research or anything like that, but watching like one or two videos of like a popular drafter or something like that would really, really helps um, your helps wrap your head around um, what is good and what is not, what you should be drafting, what you shouldn't be drafting um, that kind of thing. So I would suggest that not just because of the card pool, but because that is how you can get more cards and it doesn't cost a lot. And if you do well, you can just keep doing it. So that would be my suggestion for new arena players, for sure. Awesome. I also just think if you're new to Magic, then playing Limited 
is one of the best ways to grow your general skill set as well. Because I think that limited is the hardest format in the game. Oh yeah, I do. It's just it's like every every match is is new. You know, every match is unexpected. You really have to work hard to get the most out of your cards. In constructed formats, the average power level of the cards in the decks is a lot higher, and so even if you make a mistake, like you might draw your powerful card that gets you out of it, right? Or even if you're making suboptimal plays the entire game, you know you might just you might just draw more oros than your opponent does, or you might just top deck your hydroid crisis, or you might top deck your sweeper or whatever, and it it just kind of helps to bail you out. Whereas in limited, like you usually don't get those get out of jail free cards and so it's like every time you lose a creature or every time you make a bad block or a bad attack or every time you don't use your mana efficiently it's like really working against you and so yeah i'm i'm a huge fan of limited for that reason because it just really teaches you to to be efficient to value your board presence to really think a lot more about card advantage and and just learn combat you know I'm, i think in a lot of constructed matchups you're like i'm just going to spend this entire game blocking right or or i don't play very many creatures in my deck so i just don't have to think about combat whereas like in limited it's like how do i turn the corner they just attacked me do i attack them back right there's so many like strategic implications so all of that combines to make it like a really good format for learning in my opinion yeah, and to add to that, you're also using a lot of cards that wouldn't be considered playable. <laughs> totally. But they are in limited because you that's all you have sometimes. So, And that's the same thing for your opponent. So you'll end up seeing a lot of cards that you don't normally see in constructed formats. And on top of that, there is only a small amount of cards that you are playing with that you are able to play with, which is another reason why limited is good. You're like only dealing with that 200, however many there is in that set cards, which will help you gradually learn um, all of the, you know, cards over time. So yeah, limited is limited is pretty sweet. I love it. Well, thanks for dropping the hot knowledge. And yeah, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you here. And it's just a pleasure to watch you do what you do. And, you know, I'm so excited to see where it goes from here. I think when you celebrate your two-year anniversary, you will have a lot to celebrate. Yeah, it's been crazy, and hopefully it'll just stay crazy. Uh, thank you so much for having me. This was this was awesome. And you you and your interview, you, you reaching out to me was another part of just the wild ride that this has been. So thank you. I'm super stoked that I could participate in, in whatever way I was able to. Excellent. Well, take care, and we will see you out there. All right. Great. You too. And that's a wrap for this week. You can find us on the usual places at Arena Craft Pod. That's Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, via email, arenacraftpod at gmail.com. And of course, if you follow us on one of the platforms or leave a review on iTunes, you'll be entered into that $20 monthly drawing. And you can join our Discord by clicking the link in the show notes. We'd love to see you there. And again, catch me on my office hours and we can chat about whatever magic-related improvement you want to make. One final thing I wanted to mention, next week I'm going to be recording a crosscast with the Magic Arena Drafting Club podcast. So I'm really excited for that. I've been enjoying following those guys' content And so we're going to be getting together to bring you a special joint episode. So definitely tune in next week to catch that. I'm excited about it. I think it's going to be a good time. So until then, best of luck on 7. Take care.